Welcome to the Good Rookie Show. My name is Fahim. And my name is Nellie J, y'all. And we are Good Rookie. That's right. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Happy Good Tuesday. And guess what? It's the Good Rookie Show. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. As y'all know, we're your host coming live and direct <laughs> on a good Tuesday from Toronto, Canada. And as you know, we always bring you the hottest topics and guests. Fahim, please introduce who we got. Nice. For all basketball lovers, brace yourself. We got someone who's definitely, uh, you know, 10 toes down in regards to a uh, ball, a lot to offer. Uh, definitely for the culture. We'll be able to delve a little bit more into it. Let's welcome Samson Brew to the podcast today. Samson, 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 Samson. What up, Samson mm -hmm. Brew? The sun. What's up? How are you doing, brother? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing well. How are you guys? I'm Thank you guys well. for having me on your show. For yeah. sure. Samson, where, Samson, tell the folks where you are right now. You know what I'm, I'm saying? I'm currently in, in Oxnard, California. Oxnard, Cal. So where's Oxnard, California? Because, you know, in Canada... We know about L.A., uh, San Diego, right. uh, Sacramento, because they have, they have like, you know, sport teams there. So right. where is Oxnard compared to like the other cities that, you know, most teams people would know about? So we lie right in the middle of we're 40, 40 minutes away from Los Angeles. Uh, we're 40 minutes north and then we're 40 minutes south of Santa Barbara. So we're like right in the middle, mm -hmm. right there on the coastline. It's a, it's a beautiful place. I probably passed there because when I was in L.A., I remember going to Santa Barbara uh, but I was living in Sherman Oaks, so that means I definitely passed it. But I didn't oh, yeah. even know Oxnard was there. <laughs> it was you probably was just like this. Trust me, you you passed it. You went right through it. <laughs> um, every so, every town or city is known for something. Is there anything that Oxnard is known for? Oxnard, anything. we are known. Yes, we are known for actually hip hop. If you guys know who Mad Lib is, um, he's of from here. He's originally he's from oh. Oxnard. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so hip hop and then strawberries. Like the, our agriculture out here is some of the best. Um, so yeah, hip hop and strawberries. Hip hop nice. and strawberries. I feel like that could be like a stage name or something. I don't know what kind of name that would be. <laughs> hip hop strawberries. <laughs> we gotta figure that out. Um, but no, we're happy to have you in the podcast today, Fahim. We got some hot topics, so Fahim. So let's look at the first one going, brother. All right. So we've had in the NBA, they finally made their announcements for the. NBA all defensive first and all defensive second teams. Very interesting. So shout out to um, everyone who's won. But uh, Nelly J, if you want to go through the list of the first team and also second team, because I have some maybe uh, something to throw in in regards to the first and second team. So go ahead, Nelly J. Absolutely. So let's talk about the first team. So as you know, with the defensive teams, y'all, it's a uh, it's a center, two forwards, and two guards, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to go from first team to second team. So for the center, we got Brooke Lopez, right, coming out of Milwaukee. This is his second time uh, being on an all-defensive team selection. Then we got the two forwards, Jaron Jackson Jr., no surprise there. He was Depoy and Evan Mobley, his first time. We'll talk about that later. Um, the, the guards, we got Drew Holiday, who also won, I think, Teammate of the Year, a new award uh, by the NBA announced today. And Alex Caruso out of Chicago. So there were two Milwaukee players. Uh, both of them didn't defend well in that first round. But hey, here we are. <laughs> um, on the second team, we got the center. We got um, uh, Bam Adebayo out of Miami. Uh, Dylan Brooks was the guard along with Derek White. Question mark, question marks. And we have Draymond Green and OG Ananobi, man from Raptors. <laughs> the man himself from the UK's first time on it as a forward so on the defensive teams for him just so you know there were four players but their first time ever being selected on a defensive team so you got it mm -hmm. uh, so samson uh let's go to you since we gave the list um okay. any thoughts that anything that jumps out to you that you want to discuss um so with the first team actually with all different teams i'm really not too mad at it at all um obviously there's certain players we probably will talk about who we feel could have made the teams. Um, I do want to highlight Alex Caruso. I want to say he was top five in like deflections. Um, I want to say he might have been in the top 20 according to, um, oh my goodness, uh, like defensive rating, uh, which is very rare with guards. Um, if you look, most of them are big men. 
Uh, so uh, to be honest, I wasn't too uh, mad at the, the the defensive teams. Uh, obviously, we could highlight certain people. I think, you know, Anthony Davis, uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Uh, we could highlight Jaden uh, McDaniels. Those type of players, um, you know, could show definite love to. Um, and I actually want to ask you guys a question, if that mm -hmm. was okay. Should they add a third team to the all-defensive mm -hmm. instead of just having two teams? So that's kind of my thoughts on the all-defensive teams. Yeah, I'll jump on that. Uh, first, that's I've never really thought of that, but that would make sense. I think there's a, a pool enough of players that you can make a strong case uh, to go 15 guys deep and say these are top 15 defensive players. Um, because I'm not, they, they don't, well, okay, Nelly J, if you can actually look up, you know how they give the uh, the amount of first teams, the amount of oh, second oh, yeah, team votes. votes. And, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. so um, mm -hmm. they go through the list, and I see some names on there that, you know, given the situation of maybe a little bit of politics or whatever, could have made that second team. So I think that's a very good point, actually. That's... Yeah. yeah, I'm with that. How about you, Nelly I mean, So, like, who had the least amount of first, um, you know, ballot votes? Of course, Dylan Brooks. I don't even know how he made it. Um, let's be real. Um, his defense, <laughs> like, again, he's a no. Canadian boy. Happy for him. Alex but, Caruso. Yes, he's a good defender. Can I jump in but... with Brooks real quick, though? We can't let what happened in the playoffs affect what he did during well, the, the playoffs. No. I no, mean, I watched because the play. during the regular he, season, there, yeah, there was I, something to do with the like was not deflection, but there was some kind of advanced defensive stat that he did fare well, well in. I did see. Well, you let me know what that is, because what I oh. saw with my eyes, I was not, um, I was not like, you know what I mean? I wasn't like, oh, my God, look at that defense. Right. Like, um, but hey, um, here we are. Right. Um, this guys, let's be real. Some of these players are well deserved. Other players, I question Draymond Green, like Jimmy Butler, Giannis, I think are just always great defenders. So those guys uh, definitely to be deserve to be on the list. Um, I don't think defensive teams should be positions anyway. I think she should be the five best defenders. Bam. I don't think it should be based on actual position. So hopefully that gets taken away. But like I felt like, uh, you know, definitely Mikhail Bridges, Jimmy Butler and Giannis all deserve to be on this list. So does that mean we take away some guards, take away some um, positions? Cool. I'm okay with that. But those three should be on the, on the defensive teams. And I th I'm not mad with Evan because I know Evan, like, he had the best rating, but he was playing with Jared Allen. And, like, I right. think with defensive rating, it also impacts team defense. So if you have a really good team d defense, typically your defense also looks good. That's why with defensive rating, it's kind of skewed because if your team is good defensively, a la Memphis, a la Milwaukee, a la Boston, everyone looks better, a la Derek White. So I would like to take away the positions and just put the five, the, the best defenders, the best five, regardless of position. On top of that, Nick Claxton got freaking snubbed. Like he won, he I think he was a top three defensive player all year. And then when Kyrie and, and Kevin Durant left, everyone forgot about him. You know, so that's the biggest stuff too. So those are four players I'm naming that are better defenders than Derek White, Alex Caruso, bless his heart. You know what? I don't, I'm not mad at Alex Caruso, but I'll put him on a second team. First team, no. So I, I just feel like, you know, again, uh, four guys were snubbed. I'm not mad. I'm not mad at this list. I'm not upset that these guys got voted in. I'm just wondering if the market is is defining it. So if I'm in um, and also location of these voters. So if I'm in you know, the the Easter East Coast uh, mostly, right? I'm watching most mostly East Coast games. So maybe you can impress me more, whereas people in like Toronto, like OG, I was shocked he was selected because I know they, don't, they watch probably four national Toronto games a year, right? So oh, I think I that you. was more of like the, the Raptor fans and people talking about how he stopped and defended a lot of the great offensive players this season. Uh, but even to OG, though, remember, me. he did lead the league in steals. In steals. And that's so why that's he got something it. that's pretty notable. But, Go ahead. Yes, but Fahim, to your point, I feel like if he didn't get that, then guess what, Fahim? Who was number two on, on the most steals? By, by point, by 1.9, right, right below um, OG. Jimmy Butler, right? Mm -hmm. So how is Dylan Brooks or Draymond Green above him, right? It's just like, mm -hmm. it's just funny to me Um, because I saw Draymond Green's defense and yeah, like, no. Mm -hmm. But anyway, just my opinion. Um, <laughs> again, I'm not mad at this list. I just think that there's, I named four guys that are better defenders and they should have been on somewhere on this uh, top, I guess, 10 players and take away four of them. But 
you know, Alex Cruz, so I'm happy for him. Probably his first and last time ever having on this list. Is that going to no, happen again? No, it's not going to be his last time. I don't know. Don't it won't so? be his last time. No, I really? do not think it'll be his last time. Like I said, he's top five in deflection. To me, especially with defense, um, you're able to get deflections, get 50-50 balls. Like, that stuff matters. It's all but, like the little, the little things that we don't really see too much. And, and he's a dog. But, but guess who was top five of deflections last year that didn't get in? Fred Van Vliet. You know what I'm saying? So is it because, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, to get on this on this name on this list, it's always inconsistent, Samson. Right? Again, I'm not mad. Gotcha. I, I, Alex, I, Alex, I think is a good defender. All I'm saying is that every year there's a reason why people get on and why people don't get on. But other guys with the same stats as last year did not get on this list. Feel me? And so I guess so, my question, my question, mm-hmm. you, I have a question then because you said you you're cool with the going position list. So then, yes. wouldn't it technically, wouldn't it more so be a lot, it would be a lot of big men then? You wouldn't, you'd rarely have any um, guards be on the on those first and second teams because, well, then, again, if you're going off a defensive rating, a lot of times it's the big man that kind of get, So yeah, how about know? this? How about them go off defensive rating? How about you watch them play and you look at <laughs> how good they defend the ball? How about that? That's true. How about That's you don't just rely on, listen, steals, blocks, those are stats you can like re- you know what I mean? If you want right. to do offensive rebound, whatever you want to do, right? As whatever is a defender to you, right? But how about you watch them play defense and go, oh, this I like how he's moving. I like I, I like how he's defending. His hands are out. Like, how about you watch them play defense and, and go about how they're actually defending guys in front of them? You know what I mean? Oh, that's just so my to, opinion. But hey. No, that's fine. But when you, I think when you go off the eye test and solely off the eye test, I'm not saying uh, solely for things- I said, okay. um, I, I just said, like, there's this stats that you can look at, plus uh, you can watch. So I'm saying it has to be a bit of both. I think, to Samson's point, which is why he's correct, the folks who are voting are voting off of stats alone. And some of them yeah, are voting are. off of watching as well. I think we have to have a, a, a good mixture of both, Fahim. That's my point. Mm-hmm. Not just one okay, stat. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, even with the defensive teams, not only is there there's politics involved also, um, the biggest one that I think about, I'll never get over it, was um, Mark Gasol. He won Defensive Player of the Year, but he was an all NBA All Defensive Second Team. Team. Yep. How do you win the award, but you're not on the first team? You know. That's, uh, so that's true. there's absolutely no answer for that. So uh, yeah, there is. You know, like everything, like you mentioned it about team defense matters. Uh, you know, there's a lot of politics. Uh, into how they vote also and just the award itself but anyway um was there anyone else for you guys um that you know that you felt that you were surprised they made the list anyone that you guys were shocked about i was a little bit with Derek right. white but that's just not saying he's not deserving i just didn't really know enough about his i didn't watch enough boston um and i just even his career when he's in San Antonio, I never really pegged him as a defensive stopper. So it's maybe just as an oversight on my part. I didn't I didn't really put enough respect in his name, I guess. So I think with Derek White, I think guys went off went off the numbers again. They didn't go off the eye test. Um, I want to say he's again, he's got these advanced metrics nowadays that people <laughs> go off of. And he's like, suppose he has the guard position, he's one of the best at contesting shots. So they I want to say they put him in because of that. Like I said, there's these all these advanced metrics people are using, and I actually agree with you, Nelly. Mm-hmm. Like, go out, watch these games, watch the eye test, see how these guys are standing in front of guys. Actually, even listen to the players too. A lot of the players would tell you with themselves, "Hey, this is a hard matchup for me tonight." So, I, you know, it'd be yeah, interesting bro. to see it again. And then Nelly, yeah. and then I was gonna ask, you know, obviously Fahim kind of agreed. Do you think they should have a third team of Ooh. all defense? You know what? Um, if they go positionless, yes. Okay. That's my answer. So if they go okay. so that way, like the guards that may not be on the first team, um, the second or third team, then that's fine. But you know, um, it's it like the metrics kind of hurt defensive uh players because when you're watching guys, you're seeing how good they're defending, they're stealing, how they're engaging, even disrupting a play. Yes, I mean, I got the steal, but I disrupted your play, right? Like, I'm disrupting your offense, right? I'm getting charges or whatever you look at as a great defender, or I'm getting the spot before you are, right? I'm blocking shots. And um, another thing, Freddie was, a, I think, a top guard uh, shot blocker last year, too. So it's like, even Pat Beverly yeah. last year, I think, as well. Like, there's just so many guys. So that's why I think making it positionless, it gives everyone a chance to win who deserves it. And we're not just picking apart. Cause I think defense 
Um, we, we don't really award defenders anymore. Like we don't really highlight good defense as much. And I think we have to go back to that. Like, I think mm-hmm. that's something we're missing because people are averaging how many points a game now. Right. And if you have a really good defender, like that can help your team way more. Right. Um, someone that can actually defend and, and actually suppress a top guy, especially a wing defender who can guard multiple positions. That is, that's why those OGs, the McCall Bridges are so unique. Uh, Jimmy Butler's because they can drop points and defend your best player. Right. Absolutely. So it, it's a lost art. And I really hope the guys coming up uh, are, are actually trying to like, you know, honor that craft. Even the John T. Murray to me is a really good defender. Um, that I think could have been considered for a list this year. I think he has some really good numbers and steals as well. So, you know, it is what it is though. But yeah, I agree with the yeah. third defensive team. Uh, if it's all positionless, no problem. Yeah, so Samson, then, I think third team, definitely. But no, Samson, great insight. Uh, defensive player t- uh, teams, you know, every year, I swear for you, every year, whenever votes come out of these votes, there's always like, you know, discussion around it. I mean, it's, it's hard to really get all defensive teams perfect because who, who's voting have different perspectives and criteria around why they pick this player. So I think we're always going to have issues with any type of defensive teams that the NBA puts out in the future. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. So uh, Nelly J, you ready to go to For the Culture? For the Culture. We like to highlight individuals for the culture. And today we get to highlight Samson Brew, the third, the third. Who is an assistant coach, <laughs> assistant coach, as well as a host of he's a podcaster, y'all. The Garage Podcast. You can um in the eight hundred five. You know what I'm saying eight hundred five hoop, eight hundred five fashion, eight hundred five art, and eight hundred five culture. Woo! So big up to your podcast, but you're also assistant coach as well at Oxnard College men's basketball. So first of all, uh, Samson, I ask question with all my guests. Um, okay. you know. You have a very unique history, though. Your father um, is also in basketball. He's an actual scout for referees in the NBA. And so you grew up, and we talk about referees all the time, like referees, referees, you know, Fred Van Vliet cussed off a referee publicly. And, (laughs) you know, it's interesting that you grew up like your dad's a referee, so you saw a different, um, you know, look onto it. So I guess your love for basketball and being, you know, um, entrenched in the game is it because of your dad's influence or was it something else that kind of made you want to be more involved in the sport I, I, as an adult of course <laughs> well I think it was two, I think it was two things um number one obviously yes my dad uh, would take me everywhere with him um obviously you guys know about the infamous Drew League um and I, I remember vividly going on car rides with him when he would go ref in that league it was actually at a middle school Drew Middle School uh in Compton so I, I remember those those rides vividly there was uh, the Crenshaw League help, ran by Joe Weekly. So I got to see some of the best of the best in L.A. Uh, with my dad. Um, I used to get it, obviously, for free because he was refereeing the games. <laughs> um, so, like, obviously, the love for basketball, that's where it started there. And then um, I got to ask, I got to ask, uh, Kobe, he went, went to the Drew League, did he not? Yes, he did, right? He did. And I want to say that was when it was at Washington Park. My dad did not ref um, oh, that particular okay. day. Um, but if you look, uh, I got to give him a shout out. He ended up passing away. Uh, Mr. Tony, uh, there's a there's a sheriff officer who kind of was taking taking care of Kobe the whole time. Uh, so I got to give him a shout out. But yeah, I was at Washington Park. It was a dope, dope experience uh, to be able to watch it, not live, but seeing what it was like. So, but yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, basketball mm-hmm. is in my blood. So. Yeah, I could imagine, especially living in California, uh, entrenched in basketball. Um, right. I could imagine you just like falling in love with the game. Walk us through the aspect of coaching. I feel like it sounds tough, but also you have to really, really uh, like we talk about coaches right now. Toronto Raptors were trying to hire a coach. I don't know if you heard this, but JJ Redick was interviewed and people were like, oh, he could be a good coach. There, there's many players that became player to coach and it's so easy. When you hear stuff like that, Samson, like, how do you feel when people think just because you play basketball, that means you can coach basketball? Like, walk us through that type of, uh, you know, fans who think that way. No, absolutely. No, I think it's, if we're going to just talk about JJ real quick. I think he just understands players nowadays. I think that's one of the biggest things, um, understanding um, what it is to, you know, the workload that they're going to have to do. Um, 
managing egos, working with different types of people. Um, I think that's why, especially with JJ, people are so um, into him, particularly maybe coaching uh, at that level, at the NBA level. Because um, to me, again, these guys know how to play basketball. But I think when they talk about that, and he's like, he's a player's coach, so to speak. I think that's what more so that what that's what they're talking about. Um, like mm -hmm. I said, just understanding what it takes, um, understanding the actual job itself. Um, and I think that's what they're that's what they're more leaning towards when they talk about that type of stuff. Okay, so a, I think having a players coach is important. Mostly every NBA team has players that were coaches, right? I'm sorry. I mean, players, I mean, coaches that are were players. So a lot of teams have like I'm seeing Cassell. I'm seeing, um, you know, like a lot of teams have they had, you know, our boy Sotomayor on Boston for a while. So I think most teams have those guys as assistant coaches. But my issue is that coming from a player straight to head coaching, I think I'm not aligned there. So what's your thoughts on like a player going straight to head coach? Like, Do you think players who want to coach, which I think is fine. Do you think there should be some type of pipeline to become a head coach for those type of players? I mean, that, uh, that one's tough um, just because, uh, like how you said, there's certain players that are that that are coaches now that are going through. Um, obviously, they have a, a whole program now helping kind of players acclimate to coaching. Mm -hmm. um, so you have that type of stuff, you know, you should try to help some of these players that have been working their tails off to get a head coaching job. Um uh, you know, help them get a head coaching job because they, yeah. they've they been coach. They've been part of the player development staff. They've worked their way through yeah. um, after the playing days. Um, so, you know, I understand that. But it seems like sometimes some of these players may be connected. Maybe your star players connected with some of these uh, players that just finished uh, playing. And now mm -hmm. it's there, you know, they want that particular um, uh player who just retired to be the coach. I think about Brooklyn Nets and I wonder if the relationship uh, Katie had with Steve Nash when he was at the Warriors, I wonder if that played a factor in him getting hired in Brooklyn. So I think a lot of times it's relationships. Um, and like I said, it's, I kind of waffle on it. Like I said, I'm always pro player. So if we get more players coaching, like, man, that's, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Yeah. But we're going to have these programs in place uh, to help these, you know, former players become coaches and you have them going through the ranks going up. Um, and a lot of times, let's just be honest, man, they look like us mm -hmm. um, that have to do all those programs. And all of a sudden, they're not hired. Yes. Um, so, um, and I said, I, I, that's that's probably the biggest issue um, that I see with it. But again, if you're going to hire a player, man, um, I'm all for it. I mean, I'm all about infusing new ideas, um, uh, new thought. So, uh, like I said, that's why I kind of I'm OK with it. But also from the aspect of you're having people um uh, as I said, into these programs and become assistant coaches uh, to hopefully become a head coach one day. That's kind mm -hmm. of disingenuous a little bit. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. No, no, that totally makes sense because I, I, I'm i also aligned with I want players to coach or right. be a part of the coaching staff. I think their experience is so invaluable. And if you don't, you've never played in that, in that, I call it like a fraternity of the NBA, you have played it and you don't understand what, what these guys are going to, especially in the modern day social media. That's why I think the old school coaches do not connect well with the newer players because they both come from different like worlds and lifestyle. N name, tell me a few challenges you've had or what's some challenge you have coaching players now in the social media world. Is it another element of managing? Like you, I could, I could imagine, right? But walk me through what that what that's been like coaching players now in the social media world where people are like yo. F your coach, you know, you're good at this. Like, walk me through that, bro. <laughs> man, it's it's definitely tough. We I man, we get that all the time. Uh, we try to tell our guys, you know, kind of stay, try to stay locked in. I get it. You're gonna they're gonna have social media nowadays. Um, but don't get caught up in the outside noise. Um, like I said, we're the band of brothers, uh, we're the coaches, we uh we're we're in practice every single day. Obviously, your your family, your I call social media followers, your fans. They, you know, they want to see you succeed. Um, but, man, again, you got to put the work in every day. And I think a lot of these players, um, from what I see, they'll post on social media. Like, they have this crazy workout. They're doing this crazy stuff. A lot of times they're not. They just put up a couple shots. They want to get the action shot, put it on their social media page. And so they're not really putting in the work like they say they are. Um, and then, again, you can kind of call them out on it because you just kind of know the kind of work ethic they have. Um, and like I said, they – these these 
the, I mean, I hate to say kids because I'm still young myself, but like mm -hmm. I'm still like in that era where I didn't have social media right away. So I understood what it was to to really bust your behind and really, really, you know, work for what you were trying to, uh, you know, what you're trying to earn, what you feel like you deserve. But it seems like these kids nowadays, just they just want the uh, instant gratification. Um, they want everything right away. They don't want to wait. It's like a microwave society almost mm -hmm. um, when it comes to bloopers. So uh, it's definitely, definitely tough um, dealing with this right now. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I could only imagine how to deal with that, especially that. So you talked about player, talked about players becoming coaches. You're a, you're a really advocate of that. They gave me three things a player, a past player needs to have to be successful in the coaching world. Like three things you think they got to do, whether it's like read a book, whatever you think it is. But right. what attributes do they have to have or learn prior to coaching these kids? Well, obviously, you have to, you have to know the game. Uh, that's probably the biggest one. Uh, so they'll, they'll respect your knowledge. Uh, number two, especially with this age, it seems like not that you're their friend, but they just want to let you care and you love them uh, before they even get that information from you. And then number three, again, it's the egos. Um, how do you manage uh, dealing with this social media era from that standpoint? Um, do you manage their social media accounts? Do you tell them how to structure their social media? Because to me, too, um, one thing I try to tell our guys is that at the end of the day, your your Instagrams, your Twitters, that's that's just a social resume. So if you're if you're always promoting yourself with some crazy stuff, um, man, you 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 that's your social resume where these coaches are looking at, and you kind of mess yourself up. So kind of be professional in that standpoint. So I think if the third thing, like I said, a coach understands that portion of it too, and making sure his guys are um, or girls are. Uh, managing that well too, so that way they they present themselves in a in a positive light. Where these, um, in my case, where these college coaches uh, would come in and want them to be part of their programs, I think that's huge. So those are my three things when it comes to uh, from a player being uh, into a coach. Coach, yeah, those are that's really good advice, especially managing egos. I think that's something that I think you have to learn how to do right. Uh, learn how to deal with like pride and. You know, people have good days and bad days, right, as players and how to manage that, how to build confidence, but not to a point where, like, they don't respect you. So I definitely do like that. And my last question before I pass it to uh, Fahim, what's your advice on dealing with parents, like college parents? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to ask because I hear about this all the time. What advice do you have any coach or someone who wants to coach in the future in dealing with actual parents of, right. of, of, of players? Yeah. Um, so I also coach uh, AAU basketball as well. Um, I have a 13U team. Uh, we're called Rage Elite. Um, big and up, big up. Where, yeah, I have real, real athletes give everything. Um, when it comes to parents, um, I found that, man, just be honest with them. Like, be transparent with them. Um, they might not want to hear it, but they'll respect it. Um, I, so far in, in the JUCO, I really haven't dealt with too many parents when it comes to junior college, but I can say with high school mm -hmm. and with, with, with AAU basketball, Again, transparency. These like most of the time, if you just keep it keep it all the way real with them, um, and just you know, kind of let them know about their kid. Obviously, they love their their child. They want to see their child succeed. But um, heck, I I have an open door policy, but you can come watch practice and you can see your kid is getting their butt whooped every day in practice. <laughs> so again, um, again, have some realistic expectations for your kids. Yeah, um, obviously allow them to dream big. But again, you're you're in our practices. You're able to see it. And I'm big too on. There was a video that came out with Shane the Dribbling Machine, where that dad told his son, like, you know, put it up. Like, I have no problem with confrontation and, and telling parents, like, no, this, no, <laughs> don't tell your son that. Don't, no, let me do the coaching. You, you provide support from home, and that's what it's all about, really. So, uh, like I said, my my best advice right now is just be transparent, be honest, and that's the best you can do. Mm, yeah, I love that. I love that. Whew, man, well, big up to you coaching AAU coaching called college. It's really like it like I understand, like, you know, the game, but I think it takes a special type of person to be able to coach. Um, I think you're I think like, like you're like a psychologist, psychiatrist. You're also a, a mentor, a parent somewhat like it's many hats that you're doing within coaching um, and also a leader, right? They have to respect you, I think. And like you said, know that you care. So right. no, no, really, really good stuff, man. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. All right. So Samson, let me hit you with uh, like a practical question here. So uh, right now you're coaching 
uh, as you know, with, with coaches, you're managing uh, players. Like you could have a team, uh, depending on what, depending on what coach a team can get, um, some things might be transferable, meaning you might have a specific skill that works with your team. But if you were to coach, say, uh, at a, you know, at a college down, down the road, different players, different personnel, different things. Is there anything particular um, with your coaching style or any particular skill set that you might have in comparison to maybe other coaches in your, in your uh, division that you feel that um, is kind of specific to you, like something that you could actually apply on any team, anything that you bring or um, that's special. Right. No, or I, different. That's, no, that's actually a great question. I think with me, um, my ability to to train um like that's kind of like my biggest asset that i bring but then also like man it, at the end of the day, it's a game too so we're gonna have fun uh when we do our workouts like I, for me i play music um i play their music uh, i'm I'm more of an old school dude but man these kids they like nba young boys they whatever they want to listen to <laughs> um, I, I let them do their thing um uh and like i said i have a big there was something that came out too um, on Twitter. I'm big on open door policy. Like, boom, we can put our work in. We can have some fun doing it. But once we're done with our work, man, you can come in and talk to me about anything. I think that's probably one of my biggest assets um, that I bring to the table. And um, like I said, some of these kids, they're cra they're craving for that. They need that, um, whether it be fatherly figure, brotherly figure. Um, I would say that was probably one of my biggest assets that I bring to the table. Um, and I and I and I truly try to listen to them and hear them. Um, cause like I said, some of these kids are, are struggling. Um, and so if I can kind of play that role for them and help them out in that way, that's probably, like I said, that's probably my biggest asset that I bring to the table. Mm, okay. So I want to hit you with a hypothetical one since you mentioned right. something that kind of triggers something. Okay. <laughs> As you know, the Raptors have a vacancy for a yeah. head coaching spot. Um, usually how it goes is if you're not like an established name already, um, the, like, say, I'm just going to throw out, say, a name that's maybe, say, for instance, Steve Nash, for instance, first time coach. Um, it's wise for Steve Nash being a first time coach to have a, a, a more experienced team around him. Um, so let's just say that you were, uh, you know, up for a candidacy for the Raptors. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe people aren't familiar with your name. Um, first thing I'm assuming you can do is you're going to get some experienced people around you, so experienced assistant team. So um, I'm just wondering with the skills that you already bring to the table, because you yeah. might not have the experience that these other guys have, but you do have, everyone has something unique they can bring to the table. If you were to coach uh, the Raptors, right? And you had an experienced team around you. Um, things, for instance, like the offense, would you hire somebody who has experience in the offense or would you be able to uh, think that you could be part of the offense? Um, oh, is that well? I was no, no, I was going to go through three different things. So, we'll okay. start with the offense. Okay. What would you do hypothetically? Okay, man, I'm not going to lie to you, man. I'm big on trying to get people that have been there already. So, like you said, you just talk about me. I'm coming from Oxford College to be in, in, with the Raptors. Um, I'm, I'm going to hire a, someone that's a veteran, um, that kind of understands the offense in the NBA. Um, obviously, I'm going to try to learn as much as I can from them, but I'm going to, I'm big at, with leadership, you got to have servant leadership. So um, you have to let people be who they are. You have to let people, uh, you have to delegate and you have to trust. So I probably would, you know, within my uh, scope of figuring out who I want to coach with, um, kind of just gauge their knowledge. And then again, uh, trust. I mean, that's one of the biggest things you can have. So I definitely would delegate um, offense. Hey, if you're going to ask about defense, I'm going to do the same exact thing. I'm going to hire, I hire, right. hire a defensive coach. And then I'll probably hire... Um, with the player development, probably somebody a little bit younger. Actually, I'm not. I'm lying to you guys. I wouldn't hire somebody younger. Uh, Nelly, you know who I'd hire? I'd Ooh. hire Mark. Um, Mark? Mm -hmm. I'd I hire figured. Mark. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> I would hire Mark. Um, so shout out to Mark. Shout out to Sifu. Uh, I'm GT man. The GT man, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, my bad. Diana. Uh, mm -hmm. the, other, the other two aspects? Uh, actually, so uh, let me throw it this one. Uh, for instance, we one thing that, and this always kills me with coaching, um, calling a timeout, not really having a, a pulse on regards to momentum and how I'm going on a run, just even calling a timeout. 
and some water in the situation and do that. Um, do you think that you would delegate something like that or would you be making uh, that type of move? I would definitely make that type of call, um, especially if they went on anywhere between six to eight points. Man, I'm, I'm calling timeout and try to try to settle our guys in, um, see what's going on, where the where the breakdown is happening at. Um, and like I said, just reset their mind uh, mm -hmm. to what we've worked on, whether it be, you know, in practice and workouts and whatnot and go back on the floor. But he, like a six day run. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling timeout. I'm yeah, I'm yeah, doing that. Right. Myself. Yeah, no, I'm doing that. All right. Last one is uh, practices. What type of practice would you run with the squad? Man, I, that's interesting you say that because um, I'm hearing more and more um, practices are a little bit more easier in the NBA. Yeah, um, they just shoot around. I, I yeah. heard shoot around. <laughs> you know, yeah. Legit, yeah. that's what they are. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I would try to kind of kind of mesh a little bit of the old school with the new school. Um, I, I, I'm big on these. Like, these guys have to play basketball, man. It's what you do for a living. You can't just have shoot arounds and then expect these high-powered individuals to just go out there and just be full speed um, and, and just ready to go. So our practices would resemble it. It might be shorter practices, um, but with high intensity rather than longer than shoot arounds. Um, and obviously you'll, you'll temper it depending on like, if we got four and five nights on some back-to-backs and whatnot, um, definitely would, 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 would gauge it from there. But especially early on, man, man we getting after it. I, I want to see who can compete. I want to see who wants to compete. And I kind of want to see these young guys, um, see who we can, okay, you know, throughout the season, maybe we can sprinkle him, sprinkle him in, allow him to get more minutes, allow him to develop, which maybe uh, if we made the playoffs, he would be able to help us in the long run. So that would be it. Yeah. That's interesting. Nice. That's interesting. I have one more question to ask you, and then I'm going to talk about your podcast real quick. Um, when it comes to coaching, right, and this is one of my pet peeves, the Raptors, we had guys, Samson, uh, we had two guys in the top five most minutes played. I hate it. Right. Why do you think coaches, and I've heard different responses, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Why do you think right. some coaches, like, play players? I, I get it, it's to win, but... Right. Can there not be a balance in trusting guys off the bench to get some in-game experience? Like, I feel some coaches are like, I don't care about my young guys. I want to play my older guys because I need to win tonight. But the other guys are kind of sulking on the bench. You know, some guys who get, you know how it is. What's the, what advice do you have to coaches who need to learn how to balance a little bit of playing your veterans? But of course, giving the young guys some type of, you know, room to grow within the system. No, absolutely. Um, I think... Too many times, um, coaches they all kind of just overthink. It. Again, like you said, it's a it's a trust factor. So you got these veterans who you, you know, in the case of the Raptors, I'm pretty sure Nick Nurse, you know, just had relationships with some of these guys. So he just favored them more and just trusted them more on the floor. Um, but man, it's it's an 82 game season, man. Like you you can't run these guys down. These again, they're high powered. And I hate saying the word machines, but they, these are some of the best athletes in the freaking world. You can't just run them down. Um, so, again, you can find ways, especially with an 82-game season, to get guys to develop guys. Um, and not just, again, if you're going to have them up, not in your G League roster, they're going to be on the, on your roster at the NBA, and sprinkle them in. Um, let them let them get a taste of it. Um, I understand, too, you know, it's a business at the same time. So mm -hmm. you're trying to win games. You're trying to not get fired. Um, but heck, we've seen in cases where coaches win coach of the year, I think in Toronto and still get fired. So two, two times, <laughs> three times, so, you know, <laughs> <Three> what I'm <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I definitely would just, that would swear I would go with it, man. Trust these young guys. Um, again, they're hungry. Uh, and, and, and I think sometimes you got to put some, a little fire into some of your veterans here and there sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure they just don't sit and, you know, just, and settle almost or kind of be like a fat cat. I oh, mean, I, I need you to I need you to wrap it up. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put this guy in the fire with you, and 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 hopefully that gets you like, man, okay, coaches. He sees this young guy, man. Am, am I? Do I need to worry? Obviously, they don't need to, but again, just kind of put a little fire under their their tail. Mm, I love that. I love that. And before we leave for the culture, t t walk us through why you started your podcast, um, mm -hmm. what it's about, and yeah. you know what's your goal with the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, I got you. So. How I started it, uh, it, it was with a group of friends. Uh, we were actually in a garage. We used to do, you know, have a lot of have a lot of fun back in the day uh, in college. And I had always said, man, I'm like, man, I want to 
I want to replicate that what we what we had in college. So we always talked about sports, we talked about culture, we did all of that. Um, but where I'm from, there's a big void um in players getting exposure. Um and I feel like our area kind of is kind of disrespected in a way. So my whole thought process behind it was to create a podcast where I could then uh, kind of highlight and talk about our players. Um, one thing I do every year is I create a uh, almost like a an email list or even like a an email pamphlet, so to speak, with some of the best players on the women's side and the men's side um, that are in high school. And I'll share that with different colleges so that way that um, uh, our area can kind of get looked at in a sense. Mm. And again, not always going to be Division One. Um, some of the kids, I, I, you know, D two, D three, NAIA, but I just want to help some of these kids. Um, get out. Obviously, I want him to come to Oxford College um, with us. But if I see a kid has, uh, you know, a decent talent, they have the size, the frame, and 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 I don't see nobody really helping them out. I'm I'm just gonna take the reins and try to help them out as best I can. Um, so that's kind of where uh, the Garage Pod started, and and where I see it going. Um, man, I I kind of want to take the 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 model of like a ball of life or even a ball dogs. So I want to have an all-star game. Um, and again, just highlight my area. Like I said, I really want to put on for the 805. Um, like I said, we have a, a kind of a rich tradition over here uh, when it comes to sports, especially football. But basketball kind of gets overlooked. So that's probably my biggest thing when it comes to the Garage Pod. Well, the Garage Podcast, we're going to have the link for, so you guys can tap in, subscribe. I know I will. So Definitely Samson Brew, a lot of knowledge that you dropped in for the culture. And this is why for the culture, because Absolutely. not only are you doing things as a coach, you're also promoting the talent in your area and trying to put those guys, helping them get recruited, get the opportunity. And I think for some kids, that's all they need is someone to believe in them. So big up to what you're doing in 805. <laughs> yeah, <appreciate it. laughs> nice. All right. Um, so Nelly J, why don't we close out uh this episode with that's absurd that's absurd <laughs> but you, bro, what was absurd this week what was absurd huh. samson someone from your your end of the nation and oakland a's announcer who calls games <laughs> took a trip to the negro league museum and live on air, accidentally made, well, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt and say accidentally okay. made a slip. But <laughs> <Okay>. he <laughs> he actually had said, um, we had a great time visiting the N-word. Mm -hmm. So he used the N-word live on air. With the hard of ER. Saying the Negro, with the hard ER. Mm -hmm. The hard ER <laughs> instead of the GRO league museum and so the negro league museum was uh, discredited by that live on air i'm going with absurd absurd um first of all let's say his name for him forgot american brought his name is glenn allen quipper born May 20th 1963 his birthday will be next week let's say the man's name he's an american sports broadcaster with the oakland a's um yeah and he's a play-by-play -play announcer as well um mm -hmm. mr uh samson brew the third uh yes. what's your thoughts on this <laughs> and did you watch the clip when you saw the audacity of him saying it and y'all when you hear him say fahim it wasn't like you know he said it and he was like oops he just yeah. said it i was talking like it was like nothing like he, he said it, it like he like, said it before he, uh, clear, like it was like a actual like the, the man did not even hiccup not even a oh my, uh, nothing so samson your thoughts because you're in cali uh, when you saw yeah. this clip how did you feel samson um obviously it's definitely absurd um uh -huh. let me know if Fahim just put it up just just said it what came to my mind is that that means you use it on a, a probably not like a regular basis but that means you use it uh at home or, or with the pop of your friends how right. you may feel about uh the baseball players that you may interact with in the organization. Um, so I thought about that. Um, but I also thought about, I, you know, he was trying to big up, you know, he went to the, the Negro League Museum and, you know, then he obviously used the hard ER. And it, it wasn't just him, though. 
it was the co-host next to him, like, yeah, man, yeah. Like, yeah. Dude, that's, you know, yeah. Like, yeah Facts. Like, he didn't, even, <laughs> like, they forgot, like, like I was like, dude, you don't know what it's called? It's called the Negro? Like, man. Oh, Honestly. Yeah. That was, that, I, I, like I said, it, it let me know, okay, this man uses, he uses it on a regular basis almost. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say regular basis, but mm-hmm. for you to be yeah. that, be on also- air. So, also he's in Oakland, and I know Oakland has a very large black population. Yes. So I mean, it's just that's just not the look he's looking for, you know. No. Not at I mean, all. the I man's from Wisconsin, right? Where's Wisconsin at? Like, how far is that from Oakland, Wisconsin? That's oh, pretty far. <laughs> as far as hell, right? So like, <laughs> so he's not really from Oakland. He's from Wisconsin, but he works for Oakland. Do you know what I mean? So, right. like, I mean. I don't I was know. One, for 20 years he's been there. Um, so, you know, suspended indefinitely right now. Um, oh, he said he's suspended. Yeah, yeah. indefinitely. Oh, yep. okay. Indefinitely. Okay. I did not know that. Okay. That must be developing. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow. I'm surprised his apology wasn't enough. Usually that's how it works, right? Oh, I'm sorry. It's an accident. And then, you know, they get their job or they just continue moving so on, let, right? So, so let me tell you what his um his apology was, right? I'm big up to, I think I read on CBS, TMZ, it was everywhere, CNN. So he said a little earlier in the show, I said something didn't come out quite the way I wanted it to. I just wanted to apologize if it sounded different than I meant it to be said. I just want to apologize for that. That's a lame apology. Lame. (laughs) Like, that's like, the worst theme. The pod, hold up. And then he said later, he said again, he said again, I could not be more sorry and hor- horrified. I, this is after. So his first apology was trash. Someone must have been like, yo, bro, that tra- that apology was trash. Then he said his second apology, the, the, the second come around, he said, um, I could not, I could not be more sorry and horrified by what I said. I hope you will accept my sincerest apologies. So apology A was trash. Apology B, someone coached him to say it more PR friendly, right? Um, so it's just crazy to me. Um, it's crazy, it's unacceptable, it's disgusting, it's nasty work. You know, I talk about this Samson on this podcast, you know, old white men never shock me. So yes, it's absurd, but I'm not surprised because it's just something where we always have to deal with these types of like, oh, like, oh, I'm horrified. No, your first apology was like, I didn't mean it that way. Well, you said the ER, sir. The ER was said quite, uh, quite confidently. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think he meant it any different way, to be honest. But hey, what the hell do I know? But yeah, this this racial slur. I'm just happy that he's uh suspended indefinitely. It's absurd, absurd. And I'm honestly, guys, just so you guys know, um, he'll be rehired again by the team. Yeah. By next year, so let, is what it is. Like this is not gonna. Mm. Th- th- he will get a job in in baseball because baseball is a predominantly white g- game, white sport. So I'm gonna assume he will get a job again, um, for another team in the next year or so. So I'll give Samson the last word, but I just wanted to say the there was a study that uh, black participation and viewership um, is gradually with baseball being on the decline. Uh, baseball, they've made a few changes this year in regards to rules to kind of sp- spruce up the game, make it a little bit more exciting. You no know, pitch clock, uh, shifting the infield, stuff like that. Um, but I think Major League Baseball, they got to step in and kind of clean this up because it's not a good look that you want uh, for the league. I'll end there. Samson, anything on the way out? Um, I, I Again, I was talking about a co-host that was with him. And I want to know what his thoughts are. Has he came out with something? Oh, uh, while we're here. But technically, I don't know if we can really hold the co-host. Okay, He's well, kind of like guilty by association because he didn't really right. say anything. And I don't know if it's his job on air to correct him, you know? Right. But for him, if you're next, if you're if you were next to him and you hear that, I I I'm not, we're on air. I'm gonna be like for him, like, yo, what <laughs> what you say? Like not like not saying, but I'm gonna give that a look like. It, well, okay, just, you know what I, I get you, but it just, but it's kind of like remember Kanye when he said uh, during uh, Katrina, and he's like George Bush does not like black people, and then Mike Myers was beside him, and Mike Myers was just like, huh, like, and no. that's but that, but look, Mike Mike made like, like oh, like, my man didn't make no facial expression, no nothing, just <laughs> right. he said it, so, and he was like, yeah, like. <laughs> 
<laughs> so let me tell y'all what the co-host said. His name was Dallas Braden, right? Braden, okay. Braden, I don't know. Oh, Braden. For the, for the so ace. what he said, he said, my silence has been misrepresented. No, sir. Your silence <laughs> means that you are. <laughs> so that was his quote. Uh, Cause he felt he, people had been blasting him too. Sam said okay. he was hella quiet, but he felt that um, because he was quiet to your point, um, and guys, just to be clear, okay, this guy, uh, Frank Quipper, sorry, Glenn Quipper, forgot, sorry, Frank, you know, another white, sorry, <laughs> Frank, Glenn Quipper, because I want to forget his name after today. Glenn Quipper, um, he's not fired, y'all. He just suspended. That mm -hmm. means he's still on the payroll, still getting paid, but he has not been fired from his job. Just that FYI. Yeah. Yeah. Just suspended indefinitely. What that yeah. means is they're going to wait till everything calms down for him. When mm -hmm. the next person messes up, and then have him back on the air for the Oakland A's in, in the next two, three months. We know baseball is a long season. So right. the man is not, is not fired. He's just suspended. That's it. All right. Origin, sensitivity training. Sensitivity training. Oh, yeah. Um, right. They're going to do all that, you know, all that stuff with him. You know, that's what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back on air. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Regardless, but, but Samson, thoughts absurd. on what the... Um, him, him saying his silence is misrepresented. What's your thoughts on the guy saying that? Like the guy beside um, him, um, man. I mean, Braden, Mister Braden. I, I try to do my best not to curse, but that, that's straight mm -hmm. bullshit. Um, again, you're. I, I again, I'm, I rewatched the clip, rewatched the clip, rewatched the clip, and it's like, again, there was no reaction. Like I said, it, it whether it be with your eyes or just kind of a side eye, like, wait, what? Did, what did I just hear? It literally was my man was just shaking his head, like, <laughs> yeah. We had we, <laughs> we had barbecue. Yep. <laughs> and you're right. He did not flinch. I watched it again, and he was like, mm -hmm, "Yeah, we, oh, we had a good time. Wonderful." Yeah. Like Dallas Braden. <laughs> Come on, man. Not Dallas sure. Braden, Quipper, Quap. What I say his last name. Um, I don't know, man. But I do want to end off with this for him. The president, Bob Kendrick. He did issue a statement on Twitter. He said, "I'm aware of the unfortunate slur made by Glenn Quipper. I welcomed Glenn to the." and lbm yesterday and know he was generally excited to be here the word is painful and has no place in our society and while i don't pretend to know glenn's heart i do know that my heart is one of forgiveness i hope all of you find it in yourself to do the same i'll think about it i'll think about it mr uh kendrick bob kendrick i'll think about it but all that was right. how, that's a statement so hey all right let's put this episode in the books Y'all, that was the Good Rookie Show. So, Samson Brew the Third. I said the third. I have to say the third. Um, we'd like to give our guests a chance to do a shout out. So, the, the floor is yours. Oh, um, man. First off, I give two. I want to give a shout out to you guys for the Good Rookies. Um, obviously, you guys do an amazing job. I believe this is episode 143. Yeah. So you you straight stay. weeks, by the way. Straight weeks every week. Straight. No break. No break. No break. <laughs> 143 straight weeks. Man. So, man, I got to shout out to you guys because the consistency um, uh, with the show. So kudos to you guys. And let me just shout out. Um, there's a nonprofit organization where I live called Leaders of the New School. Um, they provide resources for um, student athletes, uh, whether it be uh, mental health training, actual uh, physical training when it comes to the different types of sports and uh, academic uh, health and academic aid. So. I want to give them a shout out. Leaders of the school uh, out here in 805. Nice. Awesome. So my shout out is going to be simple. Samson Brew, love what you're doing. Love all of the, uh, you know, organ like the, the youth you're supporting, the 805 culture, enriching and educating us on what's happening in, in, over there and coaching. Like, great advice today. I swear to you. Like, I learned a lot from your perspective. So thank you. Fahim. Mm -hmm. uh, Samson, you interview well. I mean, uh, where you're at now is probably, a, it, it, that's not, I don't think that's the end of the road for you. Uh, definitely. Uh, the way you answer these questions, amazing. So uh, shout out to you. Uh, great having you on. And uh, we'll have to have a repeat with this, most definitely. On that note, I'll just put this episode in the books. Y'all, that was a good rookie show. If you had a good time, you enjoyed yourself, please like and subscribe and tell a friend to tell a friend. We're on all platforms if you're looking for us. That's a good rookie show, Sam. So appreciate you, man. And we out. Thank you, Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs>